Okay, so next up we have ZKML with Ezekiel by Jason Morton at Z Conduit. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll start with uh, some motivation. Of course, you all know this, but I like to start with saying that digital signatures are kind of what us what, what got us started. Um, and they got us excited about blockchain, uh, but they don't really take us all the way that we'd like to go with what blockchain can do. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, <clears throat> we're really forced to program with digital signatures, not in signatures, and that leads to fundamentally complex constructions, lots of different uh, you know, authorizations and deauthorizations uh, and trees of inference um, that can be replaced uh, entirely, hopefully, by zero-knowledge proofs. It leads to chatty protocols um, whenever we have a, a consensus algorithm or anything else that uh, where each, each participant in a network needs to talk to the other. We run into speed of light problems, um, and we have fundamental limits on how fast we can go. ZK is slow, but it doesn't have those fundamental limits, so eventually it will be faster. Um, and we have limited uh, security models and privacy options that always come down to somebody storing a secret key, which may never really get us to the mainstream. Um, and as you know, zero knowledge proofs are programmable signatures. They let us take a secret input, a public message, run a public signature algorithm. That's the usual way. Uh, we get a signature that can be publicly verified in a message. And in a zero knowledge proof, we can replace the uh, private key with arbitrary private inputs, the public key with arbitrary public inputs, and we get to run any program we like. The program I like is, is machine learning programs. Um, and then we get a proof out that anyone can check. Uh, and we get you know, similar security properties. People talk about initially about ZKPs like probabilistically checkable programs, which sounds bad, but um, you know, when you remember that the probability of failure is like guessing Satoshi's keys, it doesn't sound as bad anymore. Uh, anyway, so as you know, zero knowledge proofs are becoming more programmable. Um, in the last few years, they've gone from you know, promising things to practical things that we're doing increasingly crazy stuff with. Um, the program we work on, Ezekiel, is about 10,000 times faster than it was um, when we first demoed uh, an MNIST inference proof that was verifiable on EVM in September. Um, and there's lots of tools being developed to make them easier to program with. Um, uh, PyTorch and Python if you like Ezekiel, or you can write in JavaScript or in special purpose languages. And all of these things are, are part of becoming more programmable. And I'd argue also that we're kind of at a moment where we're going from um, banking COBOL mainframe applications like rollups and privacy protocols to kind of the hobbyist uh, PC Cambrian explosion level of uh, of programs. So we're doing crazy things, putting giant parameter models, we're doing games that we just heard about, we're doing email, we're doing all this stuff. It's all very experimental and, you know, shouldn't probably be trusted with lots of money, although I'm sure it will be. Um, but, you know, it's, it's an explosion, it's exciting, um, and I'd like to sort of think about what happens as zero-knowledge proofs become, you know, not just pretty good, but as, as fast as we could possibly desire, right? Um, and one way to measure that speed is as execution speed and other as kind of floating point operations per proof. Um, you know, we started out a year ago around here, and over the past year we've gone out to here where we can shove 100 million or so floating point operations into a proof. And that starts to enable, you know, qualitatively, not just quantitatively different applications. Um, machine learning is one of them, but there are others you can imagine. And of course, nowadays we just take everything and we shove it into a LLM, so, you know, <laughs> maybe we can build a Minecraft computer in our Minecraft computer. Um, another way to think about it, another axis, is this idea of kind of proofs per chain transaction. This is a little bit more nascent of an idea, um, but one way to think about it is that something like a roll-up is shoving, uh, you know, maybe a hundred things that would normally be a transaction into one final on-chain transaction, right? Um, and each signature that goes into the roll-up is a proof, um, and then the final, you know, the final signature or the final roll-up is a proof. Um, and then there was this other experiment at Zuzulu called ZooPass, um, also Xerox Park experiment, that did, um, you, you might have one chain transaction to buy a ticket, and then you have this pass, which can generate uh, membership proofs and other zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, and then that pass you can use to get into a club or enter an event or whatever, right? So you might use, generate 100 proofs or 1,000 proofs that all 
use that single blockchain transaction as a source of truth. And they, they might get checkpointed back to the blockchain as well, right? So this is more of a social problem as well as a dev tooling problem. You know, how do we get to a world where there's a billion proofs being created per chain transaction? And my thesis is that that's actually where we're going to see some of the promise of blockchain, some of these crazy ideas that have been developed over the last five years and didn't really work for scalability reasons actually start to work. Um, by practical, I mean we have fast enough uh, uh, computation and memory usage for AI, fast enough for on-device proving, as OJ was just talking about. Um, we have uh, a good epistemology, so we know what we're proving. We know what's, what we're claiming to be true because we tie back to the EVM uh, or some other consensus layer. And we get to a billion proofs per transaction, a billion flops per proof. Um, and we, of course, need none of this matters unless we have good DevX and um, we don't need PhDs to, to, to build this. Now, I'm, I'm a PhD, I love PhDs, um, but uh, we can't expect everyone to go through that uh, pain. Um, so, two axis version of this is, you know, we have flops per proof, we have proofs per transaction. I think up here, there's gonna be really disruptive, changing the way our society organizes ourselves, changing what we mean by money, crazy things that'll happen. I'm not gonna think of those things. I'm just gonna help make it run fast enough that someone else can explode things. Um, so I invite you to do that. Um, of course, our uh, focus is on um, machine learning, on giving the blockchain eyes, taking Ethereum and giving it the ability to sort of see the physical world, make judgments, all that kind of thing. What we're doing is mostly inference for now. Um, and we take the basic idea of a signature algorithm. Of course, zero knowledge proofs replaces that with an arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary program. And the program we're putting in there is AI ML inference, um, which is increasingly getting more gadgets attached that makes it not fit that well into that box. But you can also just think about it as like Python programs. Um, okay, so here's the checkbox chart. Uh, we have three types of technologies that are getting combined here. AI ML has a great Python workflow, has a great library of models, hugging face and all that. It's widely integrated. It's very flexible. It's artificially intelligent. Um, but it's centralized. You have to trust OpenAI or whoever it is that's running your model. We have smart contracts, which are decentralized. They're trustless. They have this incredible composability property. But we pay for that with this consensus that's fundamentally limited by costs and by speed of light. And it's too, that means that it's going to always be too slow and too expensive for AI ML. Um, and then we have zero knowledge proofs, which take the, the blockchain decentralization, trustlessness, and composability and tack onto its scalability. Now one person can prove something happens and everyone else in the world can believe it if they know where to look for the verifier. But we pay for, by having to do PhD and by doing uh, you know, strange programming prior to I'm talking about circuits, weird languages. Um, and then, of course, we can combine all the checkboxes, right? <laughs> so uh, what we're trying to do is make all these things work together, give you the Python workflow of the existing models, um, and uh, put that into a zero-knowledge proof. Um, one kind of, people often ask me about the big picture, and I, I want to mention that there are many different approaches to, to ZKML. Um, in the beginning, and this is how we started out, you could, or sorry, we started here, you could hand build a proof system and a circuit for a model, um, such as in this paper. Um, you can build a custom circuit for each model in a general proof system, which is how we started. Then you can try to bake that intelligence into a compiler. Um, this is the, what we believe to be the sweet spot. Of course, other people will make different choices. Um, you can compile the compiled assembly into a circuit, just like what NIL Foundation does. Um, you can use an ML specific or general VM. Um, I like to joke about this, but in some sense, maybe this will eventually be possible, is that you could just run Python, by PyTorch, on Ubuntu, on Risk Zero. Like, in theory, that should work, right? It'd just be a little slow for now. But if Risk Zero keeps going, you know, maybe it won't be. Um, and then you can, if you want to change the trust assumptions, you could do something like a trusted execution on place. Lots of different approaches. I think they all have different trade-offs, and they'll all be applicable in different situations. Um, of course, we've made our bet as to where we think um, is most interesting for us, but um, I, I think these are all benefit the space. Um, so why do we do zero-knowledge machine learning? We want to um, give the blockchain eyes, let it perceive the physical world, let it uh, you know, do all these magic supply chain stuff that never worked out. Um, we want to do oracles that bring off-chain data and on-chain data on-chain. 
uh, by running a machine learning model. Did this hurricane hit? Did this package get delivered? We want to do identity, letting a human rather than a field element control digital assets, build a wallet that's impossible to lose, you know, let people build their own world coin in 30 minutes. You know, that's kind of our goal. Um, we want to more broadly let smart contracts uh, be able to exercise such judgment, not be fooled so easily by transactions that comply with the letter of the smart contract law, but not the spirit. Um, and there's other interesting things that we can use it for, like making sure that models in some sense sign themselves so that we, if we're afraid of AI taking over the world, we can cut them off at the actuator level instead of restricting development at the uh, up, upstream. Um, you know, I think that, however, that we're still at a place where ZK is kind of too flexible. Um, so, for example, you know, in Ezekiel, we can do private, public, hashed, or encryption, encrypted inputs and outputs and weights, um, which lets you build lots of different crypto systems. A lot of those crypto systems are probably not going to have a security property that you think they're going to have when you first think about it. So, I think as a space, it's incumbent on us to kind of shut, cut down, the, excuse me, the size of those options. And we don't want to go all the way down to digital signatures, where you can only do one thing, but we want to choose intermediate Legos that people can build with in a secure way. So suggested applications. We don't just want to hand them a, a Turing machine and say, go for it, do whatever you want, um, because you're likely to build something that doesn't make sense. OK, so lastly, I want to talk about um, just I would do a demo, but we have slides. So um, what Ezekiel is, so what do we do? You, you, you start out with just regular Python, you, this is a PyTorch rather. So you, you have a module, you define some layers, you define a function, a forward function. This could be whatever function it, uh, you like. Uh, it, maybe some convolutions, relus, stuff like that. Um, and then you export that. This is just sort of some boilerplate, which can be baked into a function if you prefer. Whatever your particular uh, system is, you um, export it to an Onyx file. Uh, and then that Onyx file is kind of a baked abstract syntax tree, frozen abstract syntax tree of the model or of the function. Um, so that's the circuit. I mean, one of the reasons that we've gone in this direction is that I think that if you want a lot of people to use ZK, you take something like PyTorch um, neural networks. This is the most widely deployed, widely used circuit language in the world, I would argue. And that's why we wanted to target it. Um, so you bake the model into a, into a, Py, into a PyTorch, into a, sorry, an Onyx file, then you generate some settings. We have some automatic calibration that helps you choose these weird parameters like how many rows and, and stuff like that. Um, and then we run a setup function. So really there are three players in a ZK game, right? There's the developer that runs the setup that decides who, what, what it means to prove and verify. There's the prover and there's the verifier. Okay, so you run a setup after, after calibration. Uh, this is all Python. This is copied from one of our uh, one of our notebook Python uh, Jupyter notebooks that's on the website on the, in the repo. Um, and then you can prove against it. You can also do this in the browser if your model's not too big. Uh, and then we verify. And I'm breaking verification up into three steps because I think I really care about verifying on chain, or at least making it possible to verify on chain. So I think that's a good way to decide what's true in a way that nobody can mess with. Um, so you create an EVM verifier, you deploy that verifier, uh, and then you can uh, verify against it through Ezekiel. So, yep, that's it. And that's the link to the GitHub if you're interested. And uh, any questions? Thank you. Great presentation. Um, could you talk just a little bit more about um, giving the blockchain eyes with respect to scalable oracles? Yeah, so um, so take something like uh, like a prediction market gnosis or you know in its first uh, uh, first incarnation. So something where you you want it to measure a thing that happened in the real world. Someone got elected a president or you know a hurricane hit a coast, a new COVID variant hit or something, right? Um, before we had this kind of ZK stuff, all we could really do is set up a complex crypto economic system where some people propose the, you know, propose the thing that we're deciding, others vote on the thing and stake against it and bet on it, and then other people make the judgment as to what, and then we have to punish, and you know, this gets really complicated, right? So alternatively, if we trust the source, by which I mean 
we need the source to somehow sign their HTTP response or someone else, some third party notary to sign it, right? So, but let's assume that we're in the future, everybody is ready for ZK, they realize it's the future, and when I, when I hit Bloomberg or, you know, Associated Press, every time I get an article back, it comes with a signature. It's a, Associated Press said a big hurricane hit the coast. We take that document, we run the model on the document. Uh, the signature, of course, is the signature of the hash. So then in the smart contract, we check the hash signature. We don't have to, we can check the signature in the proof, but that's expensive. We can also just check it on the smart contract. So we check the signature is valid. This really was the Associated Press. And then we check that the, the, the ZKML model ran and said this article said, you know, Dwayne Camacho was elected president or whatever, right? And uh, then you know, the contract knows that that thing happened. And then you can add more features, you know, if you want more articles or more sources. Similar thing if you want to say, I'm going to do a ZK version of the Amazon taking a picture of your package after they deliver it. You know, you run a model instead of disclosing that, right? So that's maybe a little bit more of a stretch, but yeah. So that's, so it, or maybe it's a supply chain thing where it's actually a high value package and you want to, yeah, so that's the idea. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, you mentioned that over one year you've had a huge improvement in the number of floating point operations you could do. Would you comment on uh, what what allowed that? Yeah, yeah. So, so we're very lucky in ZK because it's um, a lot of brilliant work has gone into it. But when the the stuff that got to everything everything actually works. There's often we all just did stuff in okay. We want it to be correct and we want it to work, right? which means we didn't pay a lot of attention to data structures and arguments and everything else, right? So a lot of that improvement just comes down to you, either you try different arguments, so different ways of arguing, say, that a matrix times a vector equals a result. There's, you have choices, right? Or you go actually into the proving system itself and you say, oh, in this place, you know, we're constructing a big vector and really we can just iterate, you know, or so we can play with the data structure. So um, another way of saying it is that uh, you know, that's a little bit more, I take the blame, it's like, okay, I did everything in the stupidest possible way the first time, and we're making it slightly less stupid, you know, <laughs> every week. Uh, and, but there's, there's a ton of low-hanging low fruit there. Um, I think that there's still probably uh, maybe 100x in just being more careful and writing tighter data structures and tighter algorithms. Um, and then there's another 10x maybe or more in GPUs, and then there's in improving the proving system actually changes the asymptotics, right? So, so there's lots of, you know, both the research that's coming down the line, lookups and everything else, folding, all this stuff um, gives you kind of algorithm, fundamental algorithmic asymptotic improvements as they come out, as they reach production, and then there's just a ton of lead bullets, engineering, rolling up your sleeves and improving things slowly. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Jason.